sense of this fella. You serious? What's your say, Cece? Uh, Diva. Diva. Princess. Princess. Mini boss. Princess. Rock star. Rock star. Multitask. Good job. The questions that have screamed out to anyone who will listen since August 13th of 2018 are why and how. Why did this have to happen? How could a seemingly normal husband and father annihilate his entire family? For what? These are the questions that only one individual in this courtroom or on this planet knows the answers to. I fully expect we will not receive the answers to these questions today nor will we, will we at any point in the future. I don't expect that he will ever tell the truth about what truly happened or why. Even if he did, there is no rational way that any human being could find those answers acceptable responses to such horrific questions. The best we can do is try to piece together some kind of understanding from the evidence that is available to us. The defendant coldly and deliberately ended four lives. Not in a fit of rage, not by way of accident, but in a calculated and sickening manner. I always enjoyed taking the girls 
places or playing outside because it was our opportunity to bond. And still, even the night before, I couldn't stop myself from what I knew would occur the next morning. August the 13th morning of, I went to the girls' room first before Shanann and I had our argument. I went to Bella's room, then Cece's room, and used a pillow from their bed. That's why the cause of death was smothering. After I left Cece's room, then I climbed back into bed with Shanann, and our argument ensued. After Shanann had passed, Bella and Cece walk back up. I'm not sure how they walk back up, but they did. It makes the act that much worse knowing I went to their rooms first and knowing I still took their lives at the location. The reason the medical examiner found OxyContin in Shanann's system is because I gave it to her. I thought it would be easier to be with Nicole if Shanann wasn't pregnant. If the world knew all of that, I'm pretty sure a new petition would be started to have me put to death, or I would be killed in prison if I ever got transferred from this institution. But there are some inaccuracies in this short testimony. The medical examiner didn't find oxycontin or oxycodone in Shanann's system at autopsy. But it is believed that it did give oxycodone to Shanann when she was in North Carolina because he wanted her to miscarry the baby that we now know as Nico. Shanann was 34 years old. She had married the defendant in November of 2012. Over the weekend leading up to August 13th, she had been at a work conference in Phoenix, Arizona and re uh, returned home in the early morning hours of August 13th. We know that she got home about 1.45 in the morning. The doorbell camera on their home shows her arriving back home uh, from the airport. Shortly thereafter, at least according to the defendant, they had a, what he referred to as an emotional conversation about the state of their marriage and about what their lives would look like going forward. What was said during that emotional conversation, only he knows. What we do know is that shortly after that, the defendant strangled her to death with his own hands. We know that he slowly took her life the morning of August 13th. We know that this was not done in an uncontrolled, vengeful manner that he tried to describe to agents from CBI and the FBI. If that were the case, you would expect to see vicious, horrible bruising about her neck, shoulders, and face. You would expect to see the hyoid bone in her neck broken. You would expect to see some kind of defensive wounds on his body as she struggled and fought for her own life. None of those are present. The only injuries that were on Shanann's body were one set of finger uh, or bruising, what appeared to be fingernail or finger mark bruising to the right side of her neck. We know that our experts will tell us that it takes two to four minutes to strangle someone to death manually with their own hands. The horror that she felt is the man that she loved wrapped his hands around her throat and choked the life out of her must have been unimaginable. Even worse, what must Bella, age four, and Celeste, age three, must have experienced or thought is their father, the one man on this planet who was supposed to nurture and protect them, was snuffing out their lives. They both died from smothering. Let me say that again. The man seated to my right smothered his daughters. Why? I really felt like I was under the influence not of a drug, but of something so evil that it changed me. Let's rewind a bit. Growing up, I was the shyest and the quietest person you'd ever meet. I kept to myself. I absorbed my surroundings and adapted to the world around me. I followed the top trends and tried to fit in. 
I was never my own person. Imagine the horror in Bella's mind as her father took her last, last breaths away. Your Honor, understand very clearly, Bella fought back for her life. The frenulum, the connective tissue between her upper lip and her gum had an inch and a half, excuse me, a centimeter and a half laceration. She bit her tongue multiple times before she died. She fought back for her life as her father smothered her. Celeste had no such injuries. In fact, she had no external injuries at all. But according to the medical examiner, she was smothered nonetheless. The defendant then methodically and calmly loaded their bodies into his work truck, not in a hasty, hasty or disorganized way. He was seen from the neighbor's doorbell camera, backing his truck into the driveway, going back and forth into the house and back out to the truck three different times, one time for each of their bodies. He then drove them away from their family home one final time, intent on hiding any evidence of the crimes that he had just committed. that love that you had for your girls like it's obvious to us and even to us we it's hard for us to understand how a dad who's given piggyback rides and you know making snacks and watching princess movies and those kinds of things um, how you get to that point you know, I don't know. Just, like I said it was just like something else was controlling me that day I had no control over what I was like to fight back yeah like when that prosecutor said that Bella bit her tongue, like repeatedly, I just, I just wanted to just bang my head up against the wall. In one final sign of callousness for his wife, his daughters, and their unborn son, and their remains, he drove them to a location that he thought no one would ever find them, to one of the oil tank batteries with which he was so familiar. He knew this was safe. He had texted a coworker the night before saying, I'll head out to that site. I'll take care of it. He had carefully ensured that he would be alone 
in the middle of the plains to secrete away the remains of his family in a place that he hoped they would never be found. In one final measure of disrespect for the family he once had, he ensured that they would not be together even in death, or he, so he thought. He disposed of them in different locations. He buried Shanann and Nico in a shallow grave away from the oil tanks. Bella and Celeste were thrown away in the oil tanks at this facility, different tanks so these little girls wouldn't be together in death. Imagine this, Your Honor. This defendant took those little girls and put them through a hatch at the top of an oil tank eight inches in diameter. Bella had scratches on her left buttocks from being shoved through this hole. A tuft of blonde hair was found on the edge of one of these hatches. The defendant told investigators that Bella's tank seemed emptier than CeCe's because of the sound that the splashes made. These were his daughters. Significantly, when his coworkers arrived at the tank battery later that morning, to a person, they all described him as acting completely normally. It was a normal work day. Even while his daughter sank in the oil and water not far away from him. And then his efforts at deception truly began. We've all seen the emotionless interviews that the defendant gives to the local media asking for help in locating his family. We watched as he claimed that the house was empty without them and that he hoped that they were somewhere safe and that he just wanted them to come home. He told investigators that they were at home sleeping when he left for work that morning and that Shanann had told him that he was, she was taking the girls to a friend's house for the day. What is striking about this case, Your Honor, beyond the horrors that I've already described to you, is the number of collateral victims that he created by his actions. While he stood in front of TV cameras asking for the safe return of his family, scores of law enforcement officers, neighbors, friends and family scoured the area, fretted for their safe return. They texted him begging for any information and sending him their best wishes, all the while he hid what he had done. The list of indirect victims does not end there. Think of the firefighters and the Colorado State Patrol hazmat experts who had to don protective suits and who were called upon to pull Bella and Celeste out of those oil tanks. Or the coroner employees who had to conduct these autopsies. Or the victim assistants who frant frantically attempted to ease the suffering of those affected. All of this, Your Honor, for what? Why? Why did this have to happen? His motive was simple, Your Honor. He had a desire for a fresh start, to begin a relationship with a new love that overpowered all decency and feelings for his wife, his daughters, and unborn son. While Shanann texted the defendant over and over again in the days and weeks leading up to her death, attempting to save her marriage, the defendant secreted pictures of his girlfriend into his phone and searched and texted, excuse me, texted her at all hours of the night. While Shanann sent the defendant self-help self and relationship counseling books, one of which ironically enough was thrown in the garbage, he was searching the internet for secluded vacation spots to take his new love in researching jewelry. And while Shanann took the girls to visit family in North Carolina, the defendant went to car museums and the sand dunes with his new girlfriend. The stark contrast between the subjects of their internet and text content is absolutely stunning. Even the morning after he killed them and disposed of their bodies, he made several phone calls. One was to the school where the girls were supposed to start, telling the school that he would, that the girls would not be coming to school anymore, that they were being unenrolled, presumably to give him some more time before law, enf law enforcement notification about them going missing. He contacted a realtor to start discussing the selling of his house, and he texted with his girlfriend about their future. None of this answers the questions of why, however. If he was this happy and wanted a new start, get a divorce. You don't annihilate your family and throw them away like garbage. Why did Nico, Celeste, Bella, and Shanann have to lose their lives in order for him to get what he wanted.
whether, you know, everything that's ever been released about the Chris Watts case, you've read the discovery, you've looked at all of the footage that has been released by Well County, or whether the Chris Watts case is just a passing fascination or a passing horror for you and you really don't know very much about it at all. I think there's one thing that is in common for everybody who've come across this case and that is why because Chris seems quite an unusual character to annihilate his family. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's so many questions about Chris Watts and did he act alone or has he taken the fall for someone? Because it's so difficult to believe that somebody like Chris, who is seemingly happy at least at surface level, would go ahead and kill his beautiful wife and his gorgeous daughters. It comes down to psychology. So what we're going to do for the rest of this film is look into the psychology of familicide. I think to understand familicide and the psychology of it, we need to look at relationship conflict. So according to the CDC, one in four women and one in seven men will experience physical assault or violence of some kind by their intimate partner at least once at some point in their life. So this is not just uh, something that affects women and it's not just something that is perpetrated by men, but there's two things I think that are important when we consider familicide. Thankfully, only a very, very small fraction of physically confrontational relationships result in homicide and even less result in familicide. So when we're looking at the research in relation to the psychology of familicide, really we've got a small pool, a small sample pool with which to look at. I think that's why, you know, so many people are interested in true crime cases because they are the extreme. It's like in some ways lots of people can empathise because maybe they've had confrontational relationships themselves, they've been a victim of DV, they see themselves in some ways, they, they, they have that empathy, but thankfully those most extreme cases are in very, very small numbers. Secondly, we've got to acknowledge that people who decide to annihilate their entire families that includes their children, they just take out their entire family, they do tend to be men. Not exclusively, but perhaps it's something about the male psyche that makes them more likely to eradicate their entire family when they're unhappy than women are. But we know even less about women who commit such atrocities. When we look at how the media addresses family annihilation and they're doing it in a serious manner rather than just a really sensationalistic one and they have interviews from psychologists or psychiatrists then the focus is very much on mental illness this is just one example it's about the top family i'm very interested in this case and it is going to be going to trial i believe the end of this year so I'm going to be following that one but this was uh, an article written about the top family interviewing a couple of psychologists this is what was said of family annihilators according to forensic psychologist N.T. Barrell they become delusional and they believe that this is a way of sparing their wife and children from some horrific event that they imagine might occur. They think there's some satanic force or there's some message they're receiving from God that says this is what needs to be done. So we've got delusions, we've got the belief that God or some force, or some a, a, de a demon, a satanic force is talking to you, is spurring you on. And we see that with Chris Watts, don't we? Him talking about dark forces or darkness. Other so-called family annihilators are under a different kind of stress, often financial. So this was the case with the Tot family and it's also the case with the Watts family. I see a lot of parallels between the Tot family and the Watts. In fact, the Tot family um, were at threat of eviction. They had a, a lovely family. Perhaps it will come out that 
top murdered his family because of these severe stressors. Could we say the same for Chris Watts? A financial burden, maybe that's something that uh, the male psyche is more likely to grasp onto, that he can't provide, you know, this kind of macho, you know, this masculine stereotype, you know, that he has to provide for his family. Indeed, the article goes on to say that Dr. Neil Websdale, director of the National Domestic Violence Review Initiative, said that financial strain is a con common theme amongst family annihilators. Roughly a quarter to a third of family annihilator cases appear to have had financial problems at the root. Websdale said, Facing potential eviction or bankruptcy, the family may be facing destruction, but appear on the surface to be respectable. And this repression, the repression of emotions, the not being able to deal with things in a manner that maintains the masculinity of the so-called breadwinner. And Beryl, the forensic psychologist, went on to say that to spare the family from this destruction, to save himself from humiliation, the repressed individual will resort to the most horrific of outcomes. We very much see that with Chris Watts. I think it's really, really important to really get into the specifics now because we can't just say, oh, well, facing financial ruin is the cause of family annihilation because many, many, many thousands, millions of people have financial problems and don't resort to killing their families. Many people suffer from mental ill health. They don't go on to annihilate their families. It's got to be a complex interaction of events within this very repressed, very unwell person for this to occur. You feel like you're in a rage at that point? How do you, how uh, that's the only way I can describe it, honestly. Like a snap. Chris Watts told agents Coda Lee and Detective Baumhover that the only way he could explain what he'd done is that he felt rage, that he just snapped. One of the overarching things we do know about familicide is that it's rarely just a situation where someone snaps completely out of the blue. Like the total nice guy completely snaps for no reason whatsoever. It's a complex array of interactions that have to occur to drive a person into annihilating their entire family. But like I said, in terms of the psychological research on familicide, there isn't that much of it. There's lots of research on DV, lots of research on homicide, but very little on familicide because we don't have, thankfully, very many cases. So we're kind of forced into looking at one case versus another case. You know, we could say, well, the Chris Watts case and the Tot case, there's some similarities between them. And that's great, but if we want to understand this phenomenon and importantly, if we can look for risk factors, if we can look for warning signs, then we have a hope in reducing the occurrence of this in the future. One of the most rigorous ways in which psychological research can be done is in the form of what we call systematic reviews. In this article here, this is a psychological study called Familicide, a Systematic Literature Review, and it was published in the journal Trauma, Violence and Abuse earlier this year, so it's, um, it's a recent study by Carlson et al. What a systematic review does is it combines lots of individual studies to try to find some overarching factors, overarching effects. So I'm not going to read through this entire article because it is a long one. I'm going to pick out some key points. They start off by giving us the summary of the abstract. Familicide has received relatively little attention and are mostly discussed in studies with broader aims. Here we review 67 studies from 18 countries on familicide. And you might think, well, 67 studies from 18 different countries, that's a lot of information. 
But you've got to remember that each study might only have one or two cases in it. When we get into that kind of situation where we're looking at one case versus another case or a small study versus another small study, you can get into kind of contradictory findings. So that's why systematic reviews are useful to bring together lots of studies into one place to look for those overarching factors. So what they got data from is the offender's gender, age and background, as well as who the victims were, their relationship to the offender. They also got data on contextual factors, such as offence characteristics, so the motivations of it, the location of it, premeditation, and whether or not the offender had committed suicide. Because in a proportion of familicides, it becomes a murder-suicide where the offender takes themselves out as well. So in a proportion of cases, we never get to find out why even the offender isn't here anymore to tell us. So they found mental health problems, relationship problems and financial difficulties were all prevalent. I'll leave a link to this and my other sources in the description box because you can see there's a lot of data here that they've included. If you've got a mind to do so, there's a, a wealth of information here for you to, to look into. Okay, so we're going to read through the discussion. The aim of this systematic review was to create a comprehensive overview of the research on familicide as defined by the attempted or completed killing of one's current or former spouse, in stroke intimate partner, and one or more biological or stepchildren. Only peer-reviewed articles, so those published in peer-reviewed journals, employing this specific definition of familicide were included. In total, as we saw in the summary, 67 studies met the criteria for inclusion concerning the incidence of familicide and characteristics of the offender, the victims, the context, the offences. We primarily discussed the findings from these studies reporting group-level data. So they're looking at the, not, they're not looking at individual cases, they're looking at overall, the groups overall, which is what we need. Um, we need more of this kind of work in this area. They also looked at warning signs reported in, in uh, the original studies, the implications of the findings, as well as methodological aspects of the studies with respect to future research, prevention and policy. OK, so the incidents. Familicide appears to be a rare phenomenon worldwide, thankfully, with an annual incident rate indicating one to two familicides per 10 million persons. And there is some indication that there's been a decrease in familicides over the last 50 years, at least in some countries. And one interesting point from this particular study um, that these authors have highlighted from Finland in 2012, although many crimes are committed under the influence of alcohol, familicides don't tend to be. And we've seen a decrease in the use of alcohol in relation to spousal homicides and familicides in recent years. But that's not across the board. In a Belgian study in 2014, there's actually been an increase. So incidents, although it's rare, it does vary across countries and possibly across time span as well. As we've seen, familicide is almost exclusively a crime perpetrated by men. Men between the ages of around 30, 35 to early 40s. So this is the time in a family's life when the children are growing up, possibly still quite young. So there's lots of pressure on this offender to provide, to be the father, to be the breadwinner. In the offender samples included in the current review, mental health problems such as depression, psychosis or paranoia, personality disorders, obsessive behaviour and substance abuse disorder were prevalent. And that's across a range of studies. But since no study reported population base rates, conclusions concerning the relevance of these mental health problems as risk factors cannot be drawn, which is a shame. We need to know more about this because so many people within the population suffer from mental health problems. The vast majority of people do not go on to murder their families. So it's, it's not just a case of, oh, well, they've got a psychotic disorder or they've got a personality disorder. 
there's much more to it than that that we, we're still only just learning about now the offenders also commonly had a history of domestic violence but the range of prevalence varied greatly as many as 60 percent of familicides in some studies there was no history of domestic violence whereas in other studies the majority did have a history of domestic violence. This is one of the contrary things that we're finding in areas where we don't have a lot of research, where a phenomenon is relatively rare. We do tend to get these inconsistencies. We just really don't know. The adult victims are most often female and the victims are most often married to the perpetrator. Concerning the child victims, the included group level studies indicated no greater risk of male or female children to become victims of familicide. The average age of child victims is between 7 and 12. The proportion of stepchildren as victims is relatively high in several of the studies, but certainly not exclusively. In group level studies, up to 29% of child victims were stepchildren, so the majority of children, therefore, were biological children. But relative to the number of stepchildren in the population overall, there is a greater representation of stepchildren. This finding is in line with research indicating that parents do not invest in stepchildren to the same degree as biological children. This is called the Cinderella effect and can be partially explained by parents being emotionally closer to their biological children by evolutionary assumptions stipulating that natural selection has promoted parental investment in biological children as these, in contrast to stepchildren, share the parents' genetic material. But unfortunately, sharing your parents' genetic material doesn't stop you becoming a victim of familicide. So let's look at the context. In most cases, the perpetrator shares the household with all of the victims and relationship problems, re recent or pending separations and financial difficulties are prevalent in these families. It has been suggested that there are two distinct types of familicide with different sets of contextual factors leading up to the crime. The first type is characterised by a despaired offender who, as an extended suicide, kills the family out of pseudo-altruistic reasons. So they're just completely despondent. They're at the end of the tether. They feel that their lives just aren't worth living. They're doing it because perhaps life just can't carry on in the way it was before. They've reached the end of the line and it would be better for the family if all of them were dead. The second type is characterised by an offender motivated by jealousy and revenge. This is the hostile type. In the latter case, the primary victim of the offender is the spouse and the children, I guess, just get caught up in the violence. So I would imagine that it's the in this kind of jealous, revenge, hostile type of offender, they're the ones who've got the previous domestic violence in the family, probably a, a higher rate of dysfunction within the family. Whereas in the despondent type, in this first type, people are shocked. People don't realise there was no apparent warning signs to the outside world. There is some empirical support for these types using cluster analysis, which is a type of statistical analysis. One of these clusters included multiple homicides where the victims were spouses and children and the offence was mostly premeditated and followed by the offender's suicide. The offenders were usually the biological father of the child victims and struggled to financially support these families. On the other hand, the second cluster of multiple homicides was characterised by a high rate of stepfathers. Intimate partner problems were prevalent in the latter cluster and the crime did typically not end with the offender taking his or her own life. So in the first cluster, the despondent type, they wanted an end to everything for the entire family. It's a complete family annihilation and, and it was carefully planned. Whereas in the other type, there's more of a, a rashness to it. There's more of an anger to it. Now, in relation to the Watts case, Watts talks about feeling rage. 
and feeling that he snapped. I don't think he did snap. I don't think we have evidence of a snapping. We don't have lots of overkill on Shanann's body. We see some anger and perhaps some rage in the way he disposed of the children, but we don't see him being overridden with jealousy. We see something that's much more carefully committed. Although an absolutely rubbish criminal, we see the signs of premeditation. The fact that he didn't kill himself, I think, is very telling. You know, he wanted a new life. He got rid of his family because he wanted a new life. Now, what do we know about familicide compared with other types of homicide that occur within the family? So the question as to whether familicide is a distinct phenomenon from other intrafamilial homicides or whether it shares characteristics with the killing of one's wife or the killings of one's children, or, you know, either their wife or their children. And this has been investigated in some studies, to some extent, conflicting results, because again, we've got very small samples. However, the findings suggest that men are even more overrepresented as perpetrators in familicide compared with other intrafamilial homicides. Firearms are the most frequently used in familicide. So a study from 2008 compared 23 surviving familicide offenders with a sample of other family offenders and found that familicide offenders did more often have personality disorder, especially with narcissistic or dependent features, and they had less often committed a previous violent offence. The samples did not differ with regard to other psychopathology, history of mental health care, substance abuse, childhood abuse or unemployment status. Familicide offenders have been found to be younger, more often married and more likely to die with suicide. The motivation of familicide offenders have been found to correspond more with fear of abandonment and narcissistic rage. Although psychotic motives were somewhat overrepresented in the familicide cases. Based on the even gender ratio of child victims and the less pronounced overrepresentation of step relationships, study back from uh, 1995 concluded that children were not the primary victims of familicide and that familicides uh, have got more in common with the killing of the spouse. The children get caught up in this. They might feel hatred of the spouse. They might want to get rid of that relationship and then somewhat like the Watts case, feel that the, the children just have to go as well. That's what we might be seeing. What about warning signs of preventative measures? In a study by Hamilton and colleagues in 2013, about half of the offenders had made suicide threats before the offence and 62% had threatened to kill the victim beforehand. In almost all of the familicide cases in a report written by the National Institute of Health and Welfare in Finland back in 2012, um, there was some evidence of premeditation, things like suicide notes, purchasing ammunition, internet search history on familicide, so how to get rid, you know, how to commit murder, that kind of thing. Again, with the Finnish data in 2012, contact between the families and social support services had been scarce, although in half of the cases the offender had sought contact with mental health services within a year preceding the offence. The reasons for consulting mental health services involve symptoms of depression, psychosis or exhaustion. So a complete overload of stress, maybe. Other studies have shown that in 13 to 44% of offenders had used mental health services before the offence. So in studies that have only shown as, as few as 13% of offenders had used mental health services before the offence, it shows very few of them have, have sought help. If we're thinking that mental ill health is one of the major reasons why these murders occur and the vast majority of offenders are not seeking help beforehand, that's got to be a learning point somewhere along the line, hasn't it? The study by Hamilton and colleagues, 2013, found that agency involvement prior to the offence was greater in intimate partner homicide cases where children have become victims 
compared with cases where there was no children in the household. Six of 13 cases of familicide had had contact with child protection services and with some of these a risk assessment had been conducted. Protection orders had been granted against the offender in about half of the cases and about half of the offenders had restricted access to the children at the time of the offence. In other studies, 20 to 25% of offenders had protection orders granted against them. So the vast majority didn't. So in conclusion, in some of the cases included in this review studies, there was some form of authority involvement prior to the offence. They were known to authorities. There was known history of domestic violence. There was known history of a child protection issue, some mental ill health that had been reported. But in many, many others, there was nothing, nothing at all. So if we go back to those two types of familicide, the despondent type and then the hostile type, then I think what we're seeing with cases like the Watts and the Tots, perhaps we're seeing more of a despondent type instead of having a history of domestic violence where just the, the outcome, unfortunately, was murder. We still have such a lot to learn about family annihilations, such a lot to learn. So we can conclude here by saying, as familicides are rare, they are also difficult to effectively prevent. However, the current review highlights the importance of increasing knowledge about the warning signs of familicide, as well as the need for implementing policies such as improving support strategies for people with mental health problems or financial difficulties, increasing awareness of the risks associated with DV and facilitating access to help-seeking services. A multidisciplinary public health approach, including the police, healthcare, social care and child protection services that work together in developing a shared risk management plan for individuals at risk, is needed. Incorporating specific risk factors for familicide into screening protocols for violence risk is also recommended. Uh, that might help some, but for those where there's no prior history of social service involvement, no prior history of mental health problems, no prior history of DV, then such preventative measures just won't work. We don't know until it happens which is really quite scary. So I hope you found this interesting. As I said, I'm going to leave a link to the sources that I've used uh, for you to dig into yourselves. We just need to know so much more from a, a research basis. And actually, I think pouring over cases like the Watts and others can give us some useful indicators. I really do think so. So let me know your comments below. I hope you're well, and I'll see you in the next video. Four lives were lost at the hands of the defendant on August 13th for reasons that we will never fully understand, nor will we know. In the end, the Rusick family was much more merciful towards him than he was towards his wife, his daughters, and his unborn son. Prison for the remainder of his life is exactly where he belongs for murdering his entire family. Thank you. Would you like to make a statement? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you.